Matthew 24, 30 says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And all the tribes of the land will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with tremendous power and glory. And I want a loud hallelujah for that one. That's what we're waiting for. And last week, we carefully dissected this passage to understand what some of those terms meant. For instance, what are the tribes of the land, which is more often translated the tribes of the earth? We learned that there is a lot of academic disagreement over the proper interpretation because tribes of the land indicate the 12 tribes of Israel, all tribes of the earth is a rather unusual way of saying everyone on the planet. Now, this was not meant as an either-or situation, but rather as both, because this is more the way that biblical prophecy actually plays out in reality. Prophecies, more often than not, carry a double meaning because they portend a double fulfillment one fulfillment that is usually relatively soon, another that is often well into the future. Now, another feature of this double fulfillment nature of biblical prophecy is that often the affected group is expanded in scope as well as in geographical area becoming more extensive. Thus, in the example, I cited two things that will happen as it regards our passage in verse 30. The 12 tribes of Israel will be gathered back to the Holy Land of Israel from their worldwide ex uh, exiles. That's on a physical level. As the final culmination of a long process of ingathering. And yet, on another level, so will those who have been grafted in to Israel, believers and Yeshua of all ethnicities, they will be gathered, we will be gathered spiritually into the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's also necessary that we back away from this passage far enough to see it as a historic panorama. Yeshua has just described the event that all Christendom and all the cosmos yearns for, his own return in power and glory. This also marks the end of the age, or at least the first moments of the climax of history as we've known it. And I put it that way because I have a, I have a little doubt that these final acts of the redemption process will occur over a very short span of a literal 15 to 22 days, which is the calendar span of the final three biblical feasts. And just as the redemptive acts of Yeshua's death and burial and resurrection, then the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell believers, all happened within a span of about 50 days. It depends on how one chooses to count it so will the final acts of redemption happen very rapidly, and they will coincide with the fall feasts. This is why our preparation for this event is so critical. Just as when we learn that a hurricane is on the way, there are precious few hours or days to prepare for its effects. Once it arrives, it's too late. It's too late. It's going to be that same way. The moment that the sign of the Son of Man appears in the sky, the time to prepare ourselves spiritually, the time to have sincerely repented, accepted Christ into our minds and our hearts for who He is, will have ended. This is why in our passage, 
that the people of the earth are described as mourning because those who don't know Yeshua will instinctively know that their doom for all eternity has come upon them. And added to those who mourn will likely be believers. Why will we mourn? because we will know and love so many that have resisted accepting Messiah. From our own spouses, to our children and grandchildren, perhaps our parents, our dearest friends, who are, as of that moment, lost forever. That's a sobering thought. Now, did Jesus' disciples understand his words as a prophecy of his return as the Son of Man coming back to Jerusalem from his heavenly home? Nothing I read tells me that they did. And it is from this perspective of his disciples not understanding their master's meaning or perhaps not entirely comprehending it in its fully literal sense that he meant it. That that's how we must understand what remains for us in these final chapters of Matthew, and also, of course, as it appears in Mark and Luke. Let's reread a portion of Matthew 24. <coughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read verses 32 to 42. 32 to 42. But when that day and hour will come, no one knows. Not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. For the Son of Man's coming will be just as it was in the days of Noah. Back then, before the flood, people went on eating and drinking, taking wives, becoming wives, right up until the day Noah entered the ark. They didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. It will be just like that when the Son of Man comes. Then there will be two men in a field. One will be taken, the other left behind. There will be two women grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left behind. So stay alert, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. Now, the remainder of the 24th chapter of Matthew is a series of illustrations that Yeshua uses to get across a few points concerning, uh, concerning the several things that will lead up to his return as the Son of Man, including the event itself. He has yet to discuss what happens immediately following his return. Now, all of these illustrations stress awareness and preparedness. This is a type of preparedness that must begin with trust in Yeshua as the redeeming Son of Man, but must also include believing Him when He speaks about things that surely sounded incomprehensible to His disciples, and it remains frightfully so within many of our churches and synagogues today. If what He was saying was easily understood and palatable and acceptable as a true vision of the future, he certainly wouldn't have had to have been so repetitive and passionate in urging his disciples to listen, to obey. Thus, Yeshua wants us to be acutely aware, on guard, so that we aren't caught by surprise or fooled by people or by events. Now, the first illustration that Jesus presents is that of a fig tree. 
and it involves what is but common sense, if not common knowledge for first century Holy Land Jews. One doesn't have to be a farmer to know that before a tree produces its fruit, first the branches sprout, new leaves form, and then only afterwards does those little nodules of fruit begin to appear. Is there intended symbolism? and the use of the fig tree as opposed to a different kind of fruit tree. Now, many good Bible scholars and teachers think there is. Okay, Most often, if they do detect symbolism in the story, it is that the fig tree represents Israel, and this comes from the record of chapter 21, where Jesus cursed a fig tree that didn't have any fruit on it, and it instantly withered and died. The usual understanding is that if the fig tree symbolically represented Israel in chapter 21, so here in chapter 24, it must represent the same. Two thoughts about this. First, as I showed you when we studied chapter 21, the fig tree did not symbolize Israel as a whole, but rather only Jerusalem as the capital of its religious leadership and hierarchy and ritual. Biblically, it's the olive tree that represents Israel as a whole. Second, I'm not sure that the fig tree is much more than a commonly known fruit tree that made for easy illustration at that moment. I mean, although Yeshua and his disciples were on the hill called the Mount of Olives, there were nearly as many fig trees there as there were olives. And since Jesus was in Jerusalem for Passover, a springtime festival, the figs were in their natural process of pushing out new leaves and the earliest sign of fruit buds would have been appearing. In other words, the fig tree was a handy object. I'm a little skeptical that the fig tree used in this illustration is symbolic of much of anything at all. Well, Christ quickly gets to the bottom line. He says, when you see the branches of a fig tree begin to grow tender and then the leaves start to sprout and then finally those small buds of fruit start to appear in that order, then clearly because of the well-known seasonal cycle of figs as they grow in the Holy Land, all know that summer is soon to arrive. And if I'm not taking this illustration too far, we must also notice and be assured that this process cannot be interrupted by any kind of power, spiritual or human, once it starts. The annual seasons happen in a specific order, and the agricultural cycles along with them, regardless of what humans want or humans do. Now certainly, there are periods of Earth history when there are disruptions to the Earth cycles. Super hot summers, too cold of springs, too little winter rains, which in turn hampers plants in doing what they normally do. You know, we've always had ice ages, and we've had very warm periods over the eons. Regardless, spring always follows winter. Summer always follows spring, even in the cold polar regions of Earth. And while I doubt the disciples were thinking in that kind of depth about what Yeshua was saying, something we of the 21st century who can come become preoccupied about the end times we need to put these concerns on pause long enough to grasp that just as the seasonal cycles are fixed due to divine order and not accident, so are the redemptive and the end times milestones fixed according to divine order. Nothing's going to interrupt them, people. Nothing. They're going to happen in the same fixed order as prophesied just as do the seasons and the agricultural cycle of a fig tree. Thus, these several redemptive history 
milestones that Jesus has so far revealed to his disciples that are the legitimate indicators of the lead up to the end times, including the notice that lots of things like wars near and far off and earthquakes and famines and all kinds of other calamities around the globe are not to be taken as those indicators. And so his followers should not mistakenly think they are. And he illustrates this by his use of the fig tree. <coughs> Let's not miss an important lesson from verse 33, especially it applies to our time. The words, when you see these things happen, means we will not know where we are in redemption history until we see these things occur. Speculation is useless. Only after the fact will we recognize these things for the signs that they are. This is a lesson that I try to regularly hammer home. <laughs> Honestly, just trying to reduce some anxieties. The only way we can truly know when prophecy is being fulfilled is to see it in hindsight. And that is because of our human nature that cannot see even one second ahead of us. All we have to go on is the immediate present and everything that's past. There's so many intricate puzzle pieces to redemption history that a sufficient number have to be properly assembled in order before we can be certain of what we're seeing. Thus, we're not to jump to conclusions or to set in times prophetic church doctrines in stone. We simply don't have sufficient information to draw anything like a clear picture. One thing we do know is certain is that for the end times prophetic fulfillment to truly be entered into, Israel must exist as a physical nation of Hebrews. Just as for the Antichrist to desecrate the temple, the temple has to exist in a Jewish-controlled Jerusalem. One of these two must-happen events both of them actually, Israel did come back into existence in 1948. But thanks to centuries of incorrect doctrines being taught, it mostly went without notice, except by several mi million furious Arabs and Muslims. Even now, the significance of it, while starting to be recognized by an increasing part of the church, is still often played down or it's just misinterpreted. This is exactly the sort of thing that is going to happen as the signal events of the entrance into the end times begin. Some who are aware and have the proper information and are patient enough for it to play out so that it can be unmistakably recognized for what it is are going to be rewarded with deliverance. Others, including those who regularly attend church and synagogue, and of course those of the world population that worship other gods or no god at all, will just be oblivious to it. They'll be looking for the wrong things, maybe not looking at all, and left out. So let's not be surprised should we be among those believers who do recognize what is happening, but will likely be severely criticized, if not outright persecuted for our efforts. What did they say today? Canceled. Verse 34 entices us with yet another challenging passage. Yeshua says that this people will certainly not pass away before all these things happen. Now, nearly all 
other than the complete Jewish Bible translation say, this generation will not pass away. Interpreting the Greek genea as people instead of generation is a legitimate option, although that is not how the term is usually used. However, I think, again, both ways are correct because it's typical of prophecy whereby the fulfillment first happens soon in a limited way to a limited number of people in a limited geographical area. Then later in the future, it happens again in a much more expansive way to a larger segment of people in a more global geographical setting. Now, if you or I were sitting there on the Mount of Olives intently listening to Yeshua's words, what might we make of what he's telling us? How would we think about it? We'd expect that sometime pretty soon, weeks, maybe months, all kinds of terrible things were going to happen, even worse than Rome's occupation of the Holy Land, and include terrifying, Cosmic events like the sun and the moon growing dark and the lights in the heavens falling. We would think that. And they did. But as it turns out, Yeshua was talking about events happening on two horizons. One near and one far. Then in verse 35, Yeshua resurrects some language that he used in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, indeed, heaven and earth will pass away, but his words, that is his teachings, will not. Now, for those of you who might be new to Seed of Abraham Torah class, I'll take a moment to recite to you something that those who've been with us for a while have heard numerous times, to say the least. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Do not think I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth passes away, not so much as a ute or a stroke will pass from the Torah. Not till everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever obeys them and teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, of the several unmistakable, definitive statements that Christ made in his Sermon on the Mount, the part that says, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a uter or stroke will pass from the Torah, the words of our focus are heaven and earth pass away. Some Bible teachers say this is just a Jewish expression, meaning something very much like the more modern English expression, until hell freezes over. That's not true. There is no known Jewish expression of the heaven and earth passing away. Yeshua is talking about an actual event that is prophesied in the Old Testament and then is recalled again in Revelation chapter 21, first verse. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth passed away and the sea was no longer there. Again, heaven, in this case meaning the heavens, the universe, the earth passing away, it's an event. It actually happens. And this is exactly how Christ meant it back in Matthew chapter 5. He uses it the same way here in Matthew chapter 24. His teachings will remain in effect alongside those of the Torah until the foretold event of Revelation 21 occurs. Well, I want to be clear. Jesus' words did not replace the Torah or the law of Moses. His words from Matthew 5 and Matthew 24 in no way oppose one another. They are two sides of the same coin. Then in verse 36, (coughs) 
we get some additional information that makes me uncertain, frankly, about just how to use Daniel's in times timeline. Yeshua says that when that day and hour come for these several things to happen in his return, no one knows. Notice that this lack of knowledge extends not only to the angels in heaven, but to himself. Himself. The Father alone holds such knowledge. Now, the theological and practical implications about this passage are considerable, and they're hotly debated. Let's address these one at a time. First of all, this issue of the words, when that day and hour come. This is meant to work alongside of the timing that Yeshua put forward using the fig tree illustration. Jesus utilizes the fig tree to make the most basic point that doesn't involve any precision of time or date, only an order in which these things happen. Just the order. That is, in the springtime, the fig tree branches, they grow tender, new leaves pop out, and then after that, the little fruit buds show themselves. Therefore, obviously, we can deduce from that, the summer's near, because summer always follows spring. And it's in the spring when the fig tree does these things. But in verse 36, Yeshua's teaching now goes from saying that while we can know in the broadest terms the approximation of what it's going to look like when the end times is approaching, we'll not ever know in advance any details of the events or about the day or the hour, a date and a time. That is, no one can say something like, on September 22nd, 2025, around evening, Christ is going to return. I hope that didn't get edited out. That said, it seems like from what Yeshua has said, that as things get very close to his return, and as more of the prophetic puzzle pieces fall into place, such as the construction of a new temple, and then later the Antichrist desecrating it. Perhaps we'll better figure out just how to insert and utilize Daniel's prophecy that deals with the timing of it all. Listen to this excerpt from Daniel chapter 12 that is more a caution than it is information. <coughs> Starting at verse 8, I heard this, but I couldn't understand what it meant. So I asked, Lord, what's going to be the outcome of all this? But he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are to remain secret and sealed up until the time of the end. Many will purify and cleanse and refine themselves, but the wicked will keep on acting wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand but those with discernment will understand. From the time the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed will be anyone who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But you go on your way until the end comes. Then you will rest and rise for your reward at the end of days. See, Daniel says, I heard this, but I couldn't understand what it meant. And God responds that knowledge of these things is going to be kept sealed away until the end. Even today, we're still in not, uh, not in a much better position to understand the finer points of this prophetic timing because what is being revealed still remains future to us. So yes, on the one hand, we will be able to recognize the season that we've entered. But on the other, 
not much more detail beyond that, although that's not going to stop some of you from trying. To be blunt, using very much mental effort and time to figure out exactly where we are in the redemptive timeline or to believe any of us can work out a pretty good handle on when Yeshua returns is only going to distract from the important work that God has for his followers right now. It can, as it has for many Christians, destroy our peace. It's made a few downright anxious and fearful. It's better to take God's words to Daniel and act upon them. But you go your way until the end comes. Then you will rest and rise for your reward at the end of the days. Worry about the things you can control, the things you can know, and leave the rest of it in God's capable hands. Now, for the highly controversial part of verse 36. It's quite interesting that until the church doctrine of the Trinity, as it is defined among many church branches, was created, this verse really never created much of a problem. We only first hear of the concept of a Trinity doctrine at about the same time the idea of creating a New Testament was being discussed among Gentile Christian leaders. That's around 200 AD. Now, it remained quite contentious until nearly the end of the fourth century when it was written into Roman church law at the Council of Nicaea. Up to then, the mystery of the exact relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was recognized but it was not until Nicaea that the church decided on a specific doctrine of that relationship that all were to adhere to. Now, when I say Trinity, as defined by many church branches, it's because it surprises many Christians to learn that there isn't just one universally recognized Trinity doctrine as the early Roman church hoped to chisel into stone. The devil, as they say, is in the details. And some of the details date back to a time when there was a raging debate within Roman Christianity over and against other Christianities, and there were several, regarding the substance of God. So rather than spending literally numerous lessons dealing with the several Trinity doctrines and the various debates over the substance of God, I'll only address the one that seems to be the most familiar, probably most prevalent, in the Western church world. The one that says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal. That is, there is no hierarchy of authority, and the unity so complete among the three persons of the Trinity, the capabilities, knowledge, and wisdom among them are fully equal. It is the fundamentals of this particular version of the Trinity doctrine that has allowed the notion to flourish in some church branches that the Father was the Old Testament God who more or less retreated into retirement in order to allow the New Testament God, Jesus the Son, to take over and replace him. Please notice that I'm talking in broad generalities, okay? because the variations among and even within denominations are many and sometimes highly nuanced. I'm going to condense the matter down by saying this. The particular doctrine of the Trinity that makes God three persons without hierarchy of equal status and knowledge defies the plain reading of the Scripture, including the New Testament. Now, I've asked some folks who believe in that particular version of the Trinity doctrine how to square that doctrine with the words of Jesus that he doesn't know when he's coming back. Only the Father. The answer is usually 
Jesus chooses not to know. I'm not sure why I didn't hear a hundred chuckles out here. He could know if he wanted to know. But for whatever reason, makes it so only his father knows. Now, I have to say that explanation leaves me flat. In my opinion, it's a rather tortured way to uphold a non-biblical belief that the three persons are precisely co-equal, even though Christ regularly prays to the Father. Is he therefore also praying to himself? He asks for the Father's will to be done. Is he therefore asking for his own will to be done? And in the Lord's Prayer, he tells people to pray, Our Father in heaven. Never does Christ tell us to pray to him. Only to the Father. When in heaven, the Son of Man appears before the Ancient of Days, a well-known and undisputed title for the Father. And the Father tells the Son of Man that he'll get up now, vacate his throne, retire, and turn everything over to Jesus. Right? No. It's not what happens. He tells the Son of Man to take a seat at his right hand which is where kings always put their chief advisor or their second in command. Therefore, these biblical facts prevent me from accepting the version of the Trinity doctrine that claims full equality of the three persons or that they have equal claim to the same knowledge and wisdom. Now, where those lines of demarcation between them Precisely fall, I do not know. Although we do get a few general examples in the scriptures. At the least, in all instances, the Father is supreme. It is He who sends His Son and His Holy Spirit to do whatever His will is. Never the other way around. I don't want to belabor this further except to say that the problem is one that is rooted in trying to satisfy our human desire to want to comprehend the mystery of God as echad, as one, when we are at the same time presented with the conundrum of dealing with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as divine parts of the same God. No earthly representation or example of this relationship exists, nor will it ever. So it will remain a mystery to our human minds until we no longer exist in this physical world and instead ascend into the purely spiritual. Now, perhaps it's just my simplistic way of going about matters, but I think it may be best to defer trying to explain or rationalize or understand God's substance or exactly how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit operate as a unity until we arrive in heaven. Rather, in faith, we are to accept it as much as we're biblically informed about it. We can accept that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are perfectly united and all are divine without accepting they all have identical capabilities, knowledge, and wisdom, which the scriptures do not say. There is an obvious, there is a biblically stated hierarchy among them that's not ambiguous. Some may be more comfortable accepting mystery as mystery than others, I suppose. I think the better path is to pursue that which is knowable versus that which is not. Therefore, we ought not feel obligated to uphold or defend man-made doctrines from ages ago that frankly didn't make any sense then and still are, they're lacking. 
In our passages, Christ makes it crystal clear. He is not privileged to know the exact timing of the end times or when he's returning. The one who will send him back does know, but he's not sharing this knowledge. So in verse 37, Yeshua illustrates not the the time or the order, but rather the circumstances of his return. He draws an analogy to Noah and the great flood. And Yeshua explains it in terms of people going about their normal lives. Nothing wicked, by the way, is mentioned in this. People were eating and drinking, not drinking in the sense of getting drunk, just normal enjoyment. Men were taking wives. Women were becoming wives. And this went right up until the day that Noah and his family entered the ark. Then, because the people did not see the sign of the times, the floodwaters came and swept them to their deaths. And Yeshua says that the prelude prelude to and the culmination of his arrival is going to be like that. Now, I don't want to make more out of this than this simple illustration of probably the best-known Bible story that every Jew knew. Perhaps the very first story they were ever taught as a small child. The mental picture is this. Noah took a very long time to build a huge ship. Years, no doubt. It is not imaginable that people didn't take notice and ask him what this strange monstrosity was and why he was building it. All but Noah's family ignored what God said was going to happen. However, there is no indication that Noah had any idea of the day or the hour that the flood would come. He only knew one thing, it would. So with global doom impending and the world oblivious to it, everyone went right on living their usual lives. Every detail of the flood story does not apply to when Yeshua comes. For instance, we are not aware of any signs given to the people of the world when Noah was building his ark, other than the fact that he was building it. We're not told that the people were warned to prepare. We're only told that they were wicked. All we have is speculation about what people thought about this giant art project. Nonetheless, the point is that Noah and his family believed God and they prepared for the flood. No one else did. When the defining moment came, it came suddenly. With that first splash of rain on the ground, the fate of all creatures on earth was sealed. It's going to be this type of circumstance and disinterest among people having no sense that something catastrophic, deadly, final is about to happen. The difference is that it seems that in Noah's day, the earth's people weren't warned about the coming event or given signs. But in the future, when the Son of Man comes, centuries of notice has been given. Signs and milestones have been erected. And what to do to prepare has been well outlined. And yet, relatively few are going to pay any attention. And so we'll be caught unaware. There's not going to be any second chances. Verses 40 to 42 describe the suddenness of it all. The lack of awareness of the earth's population as the Son of Man returns. The moral of the story is 
one must be prepared for this to happen at any moment. In the blink of an eye, when we least expect it. So while these three illustrations are speaking of mostly the same thing, the emphasis in the third one is slightly different. These verses, along with some words of Paul, form the foundation of the doctrine of what Christians call the rapture. Okay, In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we read, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry, with a call from one of the ruling angels, and with God's shofar. And those who died, united with the Messiah, will be the first to rise. Then we who are still left alive will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we will always be with the Lord. So when combined with what Paul just said, the idea that two men will be laboring in the field, one is taken, the other one left behind, and that two women will be grinding flour at home, and one is taken and the other is left behind, it probably needs to be taken in light of Noah and the flood. That is, Noah and his family were taken and the doomed that were left behind. Now, but interestingly, there are those Bible scholars who see it in reverse. They see the taken as the doomed and the left behind as the fortunate ones. Thus, the taken were swept away by judgment, and the left behind were the righteous. Now, I can't see the logic in this. No matter how one stacks this up, those left behind are going to suffer from all the calamities that occur when God pours out his wrath, and those taken won't. You know, it's a foundational biblical principle, that God does not pour out his wrath upon the righteous and the wicked together. God divides, elects, separates exactly for the purpose of meeting out wrath upon the one and favoring mercy upon the other. Noah may be the earliest and prime example of this. Therefore, as the end approaches, and as God begins pouring out his wrath globally. Early in the process, he is going to protect the millions of righteous on earth in what is really the best and most logical way. He will remove us from the scene. Now, while the timing of this removal is a worthy discussion, that's for another day. Right now, I'd just like to address what this removal, this rapture is. Now, today, I think I can say without opposition, that the mental image of most Christians have is of Christians either suddenly vanishing en masse or flying up into the air just as suddenly. Now, the flying up into the air is quite a new take on the meaning, and I think it's most unwarranted. Vanishing, that may be closer to it. But that vanishing isn't really stated. And frankly, if what this meant was for all believers to suddenly disappear, that wouldn't be very hard to say in the language of this era or any era. But assuming some kind of instantaneous vanishing is what happens, is this speaking of body or soul or both? Could this be a sudden worldwide death of all believers? without warning. So without fear and without pain, it releases our souls to heaven. Now, while there's really no more I can add to what the sudden event will be or look like, because there really is no more in the Bible to add to it, the thing that we can know is that this event is unexpected and it will occur without immediate warning. Like the people of Noah's Day. The concept of the two in the field and the two at home amounts to folks, the righteous and the wicked, going about their daily affairs as well as any other day. Now, for the disciples, 
The scene Yeshua draws is a familiar one that they view every day. So there's nothing very future about it. It's we of the far future from the 21st century that need to try to extrapolate what this means for us. Yeshua issues the bottom line in verse 42. So stay alert because you don't know on what day the Lord will come. And as he confessed earlier, neither does he. Thus the connecting fiber between these three examples is awareness, alertness, and preparedness. We'll continue next week with Matthew chapter 24. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at ToraClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.